Welcome everyone and thank you for taking the time to join us today to learn about how to find and amplify your brand's uniqueness to really make an impact. Now this is the first webinar in our three-part series brought to you by Allegra Marketing Print Mail. For additional information on our next two webinars in the series, please visit AllegraWebinars.com. My name is Andrea Stapleton with Allegra and I'm happy to be joining you today. Now, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, I encourage you to interact with us throughout this session. We will have some areas of the presentation where we'll encourage your responses, so be ready to type those into the chat box on the screen when asked. And if you have any questions or comments throughout the session, please submit them via the chat box at any time, and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. You can also interact with us on social media channels like Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook by sharing your thoughts and using the hashtag Allegra Webinars. Finally, this session is being recorded, so you'll receive the recording via email within a week. We're extremely excited about today's webinar because as marketers, we're always on the hunt for ways that we can connect with our customers and create magical moments for them. And there are some brands out there that are doing this really well. But what makes these brands successful? How do they stand out from their competition? What makes their brand unique? And really, how are they making an impact? I'm sure we've all asked ourselves these questions at one point in time or another. And impact branding is even more critical as we think about how it affects the customer journey. So as we think about the customer journey, it all starts at the top of the funnel with creating awareness. Awareness of your brand and awareness of what you do. This is increasingly important because your customers need to be aware of, what, of who you are and what you do before they can consider if they want to do business with you. And that's why Allegra is sponsoring this webinar, because branding is about more than how you look. We understand that it goes beyond just logos and taglines. So today we're going to be spending the next hour talking about how influential brands and people create meaningful connections with their audience, as well as share some universal truths of marketing that can help create impactful branding that also builds influence. To get started, I'd like to introduce our expert for today's discussion, Carla Johnson. Carla is a world-renowned speaker, author, and storyteller. Her work with Fortune 500 brands served as the foundation for the latest of her seven books, Experiences, The Seventh Era of Marketing, and it sets a powerful new way for marketing to create value for businesses. Named one of the top 10 influencers in business-to-business -business marketing and one of the top 50 women in marketing, Carla regularly challenges conventional thinking, and she's here to help all of us find our brand's uniqueness. Welcome, Carla. Hey, thank you, Andrea, and good morning, good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. And I'm delighted to talk about branding today because I think branding is one of those disciplines in business that people think is something that you do once and then you just put it on the shelf and somehow it just takes care of itself. But when we look at some of the most impactful brands that we've known and, and that are household names, we all know of some of these iconic brands. And some of them, uh, they really stand this test of time and others have fallen because they didn't understand these very essential pieces of what it takes to create a sustainable brand that will withhold itself over the life of, of a company. So when you look at companies like a Coke or a GE or a BMW, you know, those are the ones that we've known for decades and they're ones that consistently make an impact on their industries. And it doesn't matter if we're their target audience or not, they know how to attract attention that really sets standards. And then you look at brands like Netflix and Amazon. So they've created a huge impact through the disruption that they consistently bring to the market. And they are really brands that set expectations for how we as consumers expect any brand to behave. And then you look at those brands here on the screen that were once phenomenally successful. You look at a Blockbuster and a Kodak, and they didn't understand what it took to really sustain their brand and how a business has to be flexible in how they execute on the things that we're gonna cover here in this next hour. And you see where they are now, they're absolutely out of business. And then we look at the ability of a brand to bounce back once the leadership clarifies the direction of a company. And that was the case with Nokia. So they suffered um, huge from competition from companies like Samsung and Apple, and they were on the brink of bankruptcy for a while. 
but they really, through their leadership, they had a focused effort to look at what mattered most to the brand. And in really this last decade, they've come around and they're now a company that's growing in impact and in revenue. And they're inching their way back to being a really, really strong brand in Europe. And then you have you have these brands that are are an anomaly, and that's Polaroid. So they've had they've really been on a roller coaster throughout their history. So they're an 80 year old company, and right now they're on the upswing. But it was really more by chance than the fact that it was a result of a conscious strategic decision. So they're experiencing a revival because of this nostalgia attraction of hipsters and how they're going back to things from the. 80s and early 90s and reviving them again. So I think this is a company that would be fun for everybody on this webinar to pay attention to and see how well they're going to be able to execute on the things that we're going to talk about when it comes to building impact as a brand. So the most successful companies in the world really understand that branding isn't just a veneer that you use to gloss over the outside of your company. You know, it's not just putting a new coat of paint and tightening up the shutters. It's really a strategic approach to the relationships that you build with the markets you serve and the customers in them. So most of the time when we think of branding, we think that it's what we do for branding that makes things successful but it's not the logo and it's not what it looks like, just what Andrea was talking about. And it's not even really the tagline that we use, it's what the brand represents. And that's everything from how the company operates to how good the products are to how much people trust a brand. This all together in one big package is what branding is. And it's that that creates influence for a brand. So this is what we get consumers to pick up why they pick us over a competitor, why they'll pay higher prices for what we have to sell. I mean, you think of how much people pay for really well-branded products. You look at the difference between a Mitsubishi and a BMW SUV, and they have really, really close safety ratings. But a BMW will sell for more than twice the price of a Mitsubishi. And that's because BMW understands how to build influence through their brand. Now, there's no better source to look at about how we can create impact with the brand than one of the most successful ecosystems anywhere in the world when it comes to branding, and that's Hollywood. Now, whether it's stars or producers or directors or anyone else in Hollywood, whether they become a celebrity overnight or over the long haul, it's one thing that they're all in search of. And it's the same thing that matters to all of us every single day. And it doesn't matter what business you're in or what size of company we have. And that's to find the things that make each of us truly unique so that we can have an impact and stand out from everybody else in our market. So it's why there's people who are fans of Marvel movies or fans of DC. They have each other, they each have their own unique qualities. And it's why somebody would pick a movie that has Ryan Gosling starring in it over Ryan Reynolds or Jennifer Lawrence over Jennifer Aniston. So branding in Hollywood is all about how to consistently gain more exposure in the market in little ways, working themselves up to these bigger audiences by thinking about one customer at a time. Now, I want to slow down for a minute and make sure that we're all on the same page because I found that many people have different perceptions of what branding actually is. And this is how I define branding. It's this compilation of a company's name, their symbol, the design, the message, how they talk about themselves, what they, what they sell, all these features that distinctly identify a company or what it sells from another one. Now, when we look at branding, it's been around for a long time. For a lot of us, we think that this is something that's really just become more important maybe in the last 10, 20 years. But the practice itself of branding is over 6,000 years old. And it's how people would use symbols to communicate what materials were used to make something. Now, whether that was pottery or weaving or whatever it was they had to sell at the time. And it helped people identify the products that were made well or who made them. So you can see why this is being pulled forward. And the word branding itself is from an old Norse word that means to burn, because that's how people began to mark things, by placing a hot iron on it to make a mark. And that's what led to the term branding, or a trade mark. It was a mark that was used so people could understand the quality of a product that they were trading.
Now, this matters because as we look at branding, we see there's almost 200 million companies in the world. We have over 1.8 billion websites, over 5 billion Google searches a day. The question for you to really ask yourself is in all this, this mega ability to get your company out in front of people, what is it that makes yours memorable? memorable and how does yours actually create impact? Those are the questions that we're going to talk through today. So we hear people say this phrase all the time, that if somebody is going to do business with us, first they have to know this. And that kind of sounds like a no brainer. And then once they get to know us, then they'll actually like us. And then once they do these two things, then they'll trust us. And that's what leads to sales. But the one thing that people forget is that before someone can know us, they have to find us. And that's where branding comes in. And it's becoming more and more important these days as customers care more and more about the companies who do business and who they can trust, especially if you're looking at millennial buyers. Okay, now remember a couple of minutes ago when Andrea said there was going to be an interactive part? Okay, that's what we're going to do next. So tell me when you see each of these people, type into the chat box what comes to mind and we'll talk about them one by one. Okay, ready? Here's the first one. So what words come to mind when you think of Richard Branson? We are getting a lot of responses. Some of them include airline, entrepreneurship, billionaire, eccentric, um, space travel, dreamer, innovative, virgin group, virgin galactic. We do have some people who are not sure who Richard Branson is. <laughs> and that's fine too because that's part of a branding back to before people can know you and like you and trust you, they have to know who you actually are. Okay, now our second one. Jennifer Lopez. Tell me what you think of as a brand when you hear or see, hear the name Jennifer Lopez or see a picture of her. All right, we're getting singer, dancer, high energy, triple threat, Entertainer, sophisticated, businesswoman, um, award winner. There we go. So you can already see the difference between Richard Branson and Jennifer Lopez. Now, this third person, some of you may not recognize his face or maybe even his name because he has a different kind of a brand. This is Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas, the singing group. What do you think of when you hear his name or see his picture? So we're getting rapper, philanthropist, entrepreneur, singer, Black Eyed Peas, of course, uh -huh. musician, um, hip hop, songwriter. Some people are also unfamiliar, as you mentioned, with Will I Am. Um, innovator, entertainer, charitable, talented. Yeah, we can see all these little different segments of what he does that come together to create this composite of a brand for him. And now our last example is Oprah Winfrey. What do you think of when you hear Oprah's name? Iconic, mogul, philanthropist, entrepreneur, talk show host, wealthy and influential, smart, caring, generous, Motivational, Influencer, Weight Watchers, Book Club. It's fabulous. And so you, you heard some overlaps in words, things like innovator or entrepreneur or philanthropist, but each owns that, that role or that label in a different way. So these celebrities all have incredibly strong brands and we're gonna dig into them because they know some very successful things about branding that we can all learn from. Now, a big point of branding is about differentiation. And if you took the label off a product or service that you buy, how would you know it from a different one? Now think about that. What if you do the same, took the label off the product or service that you sell? 
Could people tell the difference between it and what your competitor sells? Now, I want you to think of this in a little different way. If you went through your own website or any of your marketing materials and you took your company name out, what is it that you say that's distinguishing enough that someone could still identify what you say as being true only about you? Now, I want you to think about that as we go through the things with our four celebrities now, because that's an area where I think companies are looking at their competitors and trying to say the same things so they don't miss out on what's being said. But we really have to look at how do we create impact by showing up differently. So we're going to talk about some things called universal truths. And these are truths about branding that apply whether you're a celebrity or if you work for a healthcare system or an education or you work for an agency, it doesn't matter. These are the foundational truths of all successful brands. So as we go through each characteristic of these brands, we're gonna look at what are these universal truths that they know that they're so successful with that you can apply to your own business to make a bigger impact. Okay, so we're gonna start with our friend, Sir Richard. Now, Sir Richard Branson, I, I had to look this up because I thought, how does a regular person become a, uh, a sir? And he was actually knighted by the Prince of Wales, and that's how he earned his sir title. And Richard Branson has a phenomenal reputation for a brand, both his personal brand and his companies for starting with purpose and values and what matters to him and the companies he started. So we're going to dig into this because this is the very first step, the foundational step in creating a brand that has impact is to be able to identify and articulate and then communicate what it is that you stand for. So purpose and values are becoming much more important, especially in the last five years, as we see this change in dynamics with the labor market. So as more millennials start looking for jobs, they want to know what does a company stand for beyond just making money? Now, many companies have come up with their mission and their vision, but purpose is different, and it's how we define brand purpose. Now, this is these are some of the characteristics of a brand purpose. Is that One is that people care about why you're doing things more than what you actually do. We look at what is the difference that you make in the world, and this isn't just about making money. It's never just about making money. How are you moving an industry forward? How are you adding value? How are you making professionals better? We look at what's something that only you can deliver, and that's really important because companies need to take a stand in what it is that they feel comes from the heart of why they were created and what it is that they do. Now, Next is what drives you beyond the products or services that you sell? What is it that you ultimately want to accomplish? Now, there's a, um, uh, a professor of marketing who in the 1940s talked about people don't buy a quarter inch nail. They buy the reason, you know, what they can do because of it. So we look at that. People don't, they don't care about the quarter inch nail necessarily. They want to be able to have a nail that they can hammer into the wall so that they can have a picture so that every time they walk by that picture, they're reminded of their family and what their family means to them. That's what drives people beyond the products or services that you sell. Now, we look at Virgin's brand purpose, and their ultimate purpose is changing business for good. And you can read through their specific purpose statements that they have that support their bigger purpose and their, and their goals because they are very clear about their brand purpose. And these purpose, um, uh, the details of their purpose, they have it on their website and it's in a lot of other areas in their business. So they're very forward with being open and vocal and saying, this is what drives our decision. So they clearly have defined what this actually means for Virgin and they use that as their North Star for how they make decisions for what it is that they do. Now, along with purpose comes values. And like purpose, values are a long-term thing. When your brand was established, you should have named its top corporate values. Like, what is it that you believe in? And you can see some examples here from Virgin. They're supportive, they're respectful, they're proud, adventurous, passionate, creative. And values don't have to be just one word statements. They can be, you know, a phrase that really encapsulates what it is that you believe in. But these were the values that Virgin built into their branding strategy. And this is what attracts 
people, both customers and employees, employees to their business. Now, when you create yours, if you stray too much from these values, you will ultimately show that your brand is inconsistent because you're not functioning from the place of what you say that you believe in. And that goes back to people knowing, like, and entrusting you, that if you express your values, but you don't follow them, it makes people believe that you are not a trustworthy brand. And you look at that and what your loyal customers look at, how well are you living out your values? Because that's what makes them loyal customers. Now, when we look at a company that hasn't always lived their values and what they believe in, here's an example that didn't keep its purpose and its values front and center when it made choices about what markets to go into. So we all know Colgate as a toothpaste, and it promises those pearly whites and that fresh breath. But, you know, about 30 years ago, this toothpaste brand, what it was so well known for and what it believed in, launched a product line called Colgate Kitchen Entrees. And they wanted to capture this frozen food, ready-to-eat meal market. And what they were trying to do is harness this brand loyalty they had for their oral products and pull it into another market. They hoped that customers would enjoy eating cold, would enjoy eating these lasagna dinners, I guess, and then brushing their teeth. But it went really, really bad really fast because it was just not consistent with the values and the purpose that the company had expressed for so long. So this was pulled off the shelf pretty quickly. Now, when we look at this, it failed because brand extensions can be really successful and it can help you introduce new products into you know, um, new markets under this established brand name, but you have to be able to be congruent with what you already have set up with your brand. Now, the values and expressions, um, expectations that are conjured up with a brand, that's what you associate with whether or not you believe and trust what's happening next. Okay, now we're gonna look at a brand that does branding really well. And this is Teach for America. Now they're a nonprofit and they do a fabulous job with understanding what makes it unique and then communicating that. So Teach for America, it's a nonprofit that recruits teachers for underserved communities throughout the US and they have an educational mission and they're really, really collaborative. Now, their culture is founded on five core values, transformational change, team, leadership, respect, and humility and diversity. And this is what guides the actions and the decisions of, the, um, of everybody who works for the nonprofit or who has volunteered for them or the alumni who still represent it. So when you go to their values page, you can see here, they have it right there on their values. They list their values, they list their impact, and then when you go to the values page, they've clearly articulated what the values are and what they have that supports them and their brand purpose. Now, here's a screenshot of three of them on the left, and then I've listed the other four on the right. So this is what matters to them, and this is what guides all of their decisions. And then if you click on the impact page, that takes you to another one where they remind visitors about who they are as a community and change makers and coalition builders. They talk about leaders who teach and teachers who lead. And then right below that, they give you evidence of the impact that they've been able to make that directly ties to their purpose and values. So this is really important because to become powerfully influential and make that impact as a brand, you have to go beyond just articulating what your brand purpose and values are, and you have to be able to prove evidence that you really are walking that talk. Okay, so when we look at this purpose and values, here's our universal truths that apply whether you anything for your own company. This is your first universal truth, is that you have to articulate the difference that you make in the world and the behaviors that support how you will actually make this happen. This is what makes up your purpose, and this is what makes up your values. Now, the second thing is that once you do that, people will be attracted to you because of what you believe. Now, we see this with people that we interact with every day, with our friends, with the people who we like, or those that we don't like. We have that attraction or repel because of what it is that they believe. It's the very same thing for a brand. Now, you really build that impact by proving that you walk the talk, by aligning everything that you do, everything in the company's behavior to those values and being able to show 
that you're delivering on this purpose. Now, this is really crucial also to show this to employees, not just external audiences, because employees know where everything is, you know, what's under the hood. So they, they're the ones who represent the brand. It's not just marketing and sales. So when you prove to your employees that you walk the talk, that gives them more confidence, more pride, more everything in representing your company. So that's something to really keep in mind. Okay, now our second area is looking at personality. Now Jennifer Lopez, like some, some of you pointed out, she's an entertainer, a singer, an actress, a model, a philanthropist, an entre entrepreneur. Somebody called her a triple threat. threat. I think that number's a lot higher than just three. And you look at her and you compare her, you know, among the sea of blonde haired, blue eyed leading ladies of Hollywood. And this, this Jenny from the block, she's never forgotten her roots as a Puerto Rican Latina from the Bronx. And in fact, she's really supported her community to further define her personal brand. And in doing that, she's been able to break down some of these um, really strong stereotypes and racial barriers in the entertainment industry. And she's paved the way for other Latinos to follow her. Now, Jennifer's crossover appeal is amazing. So she started out as a dancer on a show called In Living Color. That's where she got her big break. But she sings Latin ballads with her ex-husband, Mark Anthony. She's a leading lady and she's a wedding planner opposite, you know, A-list actor like Matthew McConaughey. She's demonstrated this uncanny ability to wear so many hats and resonate with a variety of demographics and ethnicities. And the secret to her success is about how her brand appeals to both young and old, guys and girls, and it's because of her personality. Now, when we look at personality, there's archetypes of a brand, and they all show up as different types of personalities. So there was a Swiss psychologist and psychoanalyst who lived in the 1800s. His name was Carl Jung, and maybe some of, some of you have probably heard of him. So he had this theory that people use concepts to understand things that feel complex to them and that they're hard to understand. So he studied different cultures, different societies through history, and he came up with a list of 12 different archetypes that were both recognizable and timeless. And he said that these categories all exhibit personality traits that are easy to understand and apply directly to brands. Of, you know, it doesn't matter what size of a company that you are and how you present yourself to the world, what your personality is. So this means for companies that want to define who their audience are, the first place that they have to start is understanding their own archetype. And then from there, marketers and business owners will have a much easier time identifying specific customer personas. So it's rare that a brand only exhibits one of these archetype personalities. Usually it's a combination that makes up the description that you see in this inner white circle where it says provide structure, yearn for spiritual, leave a mark, connect to others. And so that's absolutely the case with Jennifer Lopez. So when you look at how she shows up for her audiences, whether it's for concerts or movies or the products that she sells or endorses, she as a brand lives in this lower right-hand quadrant. So we see her being a hero in many of the, act, the characters that she plays in her movie roles. She's a magician with a story that she consistently tells about how she's made her dreams of going from this Jenny from the block to this highest paid star in Hollywood. And she expresses this outlaw archetype with the things that are just as basic as her fashion choices. And that's definitely an area where she pushes her brand. Now, take a look at these, um, these two notes that I've made in the bottom left-hand corner. So you can go to the source and read more about each of these 12 archetypes. And then the link below, you can go to this link and take the quiz for you or your brand and find out which of these archetypes you're showing up in as the world. So I know I took mine and I found it really interesting because I was a jester, I was a creator, and I was an outlaw. So when we talk about your combination of things, you'll see that come out if you take that quiz. Now, when we look at Jennifer Lopez and how she shows up as a brand, we see that her commitment to really expressing her personality through these archetypes of her brand has meant that she's been able to expand into so many different areas and her audience, her customer base, continues to grow and keeps following her along the way.
So she's incredibly diverse in her career with singing and dancing. She's the producer and the host of World of Dance, and she's been a host for American Idol. She's absolutely known for her fitness, which makes her very bankable and a, a big influencer for fashion companies. And she's had hit after hit when it comes to acting. Now, Jennifer is incredibly smart in how she's been able to take what makes her truly unique and stay true to that and bring it out to her advantage to become an incredibly impactful brand. So now when we compare someone who's so successful with their brand personality, now we're going to look at that with a brand that wasn't and how branding went really bad really quickly. So a big example of a disaster was the personality that JC Penny presented to the world. So one of the first problems with them is that they had gone through three different rebrands in just three three years. So <laughs> they were kind of acting like an adolescent who was trying to figure out what personality would make them most popular. And then they were just tired of not being one of the cool kids. So they hired a new um, executive who had rolled out Apple's retail stores and he'd been very successful with it. And him, his name was Ron Johnson. And he was their new CEO that they brought in in 2012. So first what he did is that he replaced sales and coupons with everyday low prices. He introduced this fair and square pricing strategy, but the customer base didn't like that. They were attracted to JCPenney because of this personality about the deals that they would get through coupons and price markdowns. Shoppers loved that and it created this sense of accomplishment when they could read something as simple as how much you saved that line at the bottom of their sales receipts. Now, what JCPenney didn't understand is how much its core customer base loved, loved, loved its original personality. And it was all about couponing. So Ron changed the merchandise and he changed the overall store layout and design. And he created these small boutique shops to try to make JCPenney a hip shopping destination. But a lot of its oldest and the most loyal customers felt like they weren't JCPenney target customers anymore. And they felt that they were alienated by this, this department store that they had loved. And you know, when a customer feels alienated, they show it with their money. And they had gone, JCPenney lost $43 billion in sales in just 18 months because of this new personality that they rolled out. Now, it takes time and repetition for customers to go from becoming aware of you to remembering and considering you. So understanding your brand personality gives you this glue of consistency while still giving you some leeway about how you show up and the risks that you can take if you choose to take any risks. Now, this is foundational in getting people to remember your brand and trusting it. Now, we compare this major failure of JCPenney with a great brand that I love, and that's called Coach Art. Now, this is an organization with a purpose to bring fun and joy into the lives of chronically ill children and their siblings. So they have over 1,500 volunteers, which is something important to pay attention to because when it comes to brand personality and getting a brand to show up consistently, having people you don't pay, like employees, you pay them, but these volunteers for Coach Art, they're able to represent the brand consistently, and that is so important in getting people to trust you. So one of the things that helps Coach Art is that they know their archetype really well. They're a caregiver, and they express it consistently and clearly across every single channel that they have. Now, the name itself is a simple description of the work that they do. Even their logo expresses the personality. It's a simple font that's separated by a heart. Now, when you go to their website, their social media area has these engaging pictures of children that they serve. And they feature kids making art, and they're playing instruments and learning sports. And whenever you look at a coach art social media page, you're reminded of this simple yet profound message of what they do. Now, this is their Facebook page, and you can see here's pictures of volunteers. They're smiling. They're having fun. You go to their Instagram page, and you can see the same thing here. It's kids, it's activities, it's people who care coming together to serve their purpose and express their personality. Now, the universal truths that I want you to remember about personality are these. 
is that I want you to intentionally identify your brand personality and how you want to show up in the world. I want you to go back and take this archetype test for you and see how you show up. And is it true to what you believe your brand really is? Because maybe there's some adjustments you need to start making. Now, the second thing is that make sure the archetype, the personality of your brand supports your brand purpose and values. Now, for coach art, they would be the rebel and the maverick and the pushing the edge like somebody like Jennifer Lopez is because that doesn't support who they really are as an organization. So, now once you know your archetype and you know how it supports your brand purpose and values, now consistently show up in the world like this every single time. That is so important. Now, the third thing when it comes to branding is understanding people. Who are the people that are your audience? Now that you know your purpose and your values, what you stand for, you know your own personality, who are the people that you would target for your audience? Now, Will I Am is he's an entertainer, he's a creative innovator, he's a seven time Grammy Award winner, and he's the founder of a company that he started called I Am. And he's known, of course, for his work with the Black Eyed Peas. They've sold over 31 million albums and 58 million singles worldwide. Now, this quote is really interesting for Will I Am because there's something that he understands really, really well, and that's that different groups of people that he's able to connect with. Because if you recognize him right off the bat, then you probably know him as the Black Eyed Peas because he's one of the founders. But if you aren't familiar with music, but you live in the tech world, maybe you know him from that. So he has an interesting approach because what he does is that he understands his purpose and he knows his brand's personalities. And now we're looking at how he's able to leverage this brand to expand in ways that many companies wouldn't be able to make the leap. So first, you see here, there's music. He's the founding member of the Black Eyed Peas and he's a musical producer. And he's produced music with people like Michael Jackson and Rihanna and Lady Gaga, Usher, and Justin Timberlake. And then there's entertainment. So he's an actor and he was in one of the, um, the X-Men Origins movie. And he was also the voice on the voice of, um, on the show The Voice in the UK and Australia. And he's done voiceovers for some kids animated film. Then you look at fashion. So he actually went to the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, and he launched a fashion line about the time that the Black Eyed Peas really took off. And there's rumors now about him launching a, a sunglass line. So then we look at philanthropy. He does a lot to support high school robotics teams, and he was recognized for all that he does to raise awareness for one of the nonprofits called First Robotics Competition. Then you take that and he's been able to leverage it into technology because of his insatiable fascination with technology. Intel hired them to be their director of creative innovation. So when you look at his track record of all the people he connects with, he keeps creeping into more and more markets. And the common denominator is that these people are people who want to change the world in whatever format they take it. Now, when we look at Will I Am and how he's able to be so successful with his brand, and we compare that to a brand that had branding gone wrong, you know, I look at the branding that the Nebraska State Tourism Office announced last fall, and I'm a huge fan of Nebraska because I grew up there, and it is a beautiful state with great people who are incredible neighbors and they're generous and they're giving and they're kind. And that's why you're hearing these stories about how neighbors are helping each other rebuild because of these horrible floods that they've had the last few weeks. Now, the previous branding for the state was Nebraska, the good life. And it's been praised for the art scene that Omaha has. And for a long time, the University of Nebraska college football team was a recruiting pool for the NFL athletes. And it has spectacular wildlife, and it's home to one of the world's richest people, Warren Buffett. But Nebraska has an image problem because for the last four years, it's been dead last on the list of states that tourists are, inter are interested in coming to. And so the state tried to use this as an advantage, but the response was just a chorus of groans. And they could have highlighted the fact that it's an unpretentious place, an uncomplicated that you can escape from this big city life and see these open plains 
and you know get to know these really warm people and part of the problem i think is because they hired a branding agency that was from outside of the state and they didn't know all these beautiful characteristics of nebraska now we compare that to branding that's done really really well so zipcar is reimagining the urban cityscapes by offering this personal transportation cars in this case as a service not as a product so we hear about software as a service this is transportation as a service. So you can see here on the screenshot from the website, they talk about how you can join, apply online, drive, you know, book a car for an hour or a day, and then return. So they are looking at transportation, not as the products that you sell, but for transportation as a service. Now, Zipcar is innovative and they're disruptive, but they're still really personal and they're locally focused and they're very, environmentally responsible. So they had gone through a rebranding and the goal with that was to invigorate how this revolutionary vision is reflected in the entirety of all of the marketing and all of the communication efforts. Now, when they looked at approaching specific audiences across a range of ages and demographics, they do it in a conversational tone that's aspirational. It's relatable. You know, it's sassy when you look at some of the things that they say. And the brand story, it's really told in a witty and conversational way. They have this, um, uh, a wide color palette that shows and underscores that personality and that sass. And they understand that, that when you approach people sounding like five different companies, none of which speak their language, they're going to move on really quickly. So that's why they pay attention. Their language, what they talk about, how they talk about, all represents the people who they want to connect with. That's why they're so successful is because they have that consistency in how they show up in the lives of the people who they want to become customers. Now, when we look at that, Here's the universal truths when it comes to uh, finding and attracting the people that you want to your brand. So the first is that you have to get to know your customers really, really well, and then understand what influences them. Now, I always talk about, uh, you know, marketers in general. <clears throat> we say that marketers are the voice of the customer. But I'll go and ask a marketer, when was the last time you went and sat down and just talked to a customer face to face or picked up the phone or anything like that? And they're like, um, I haven't really ever done that. But I look at all this data that comes in. That doesn't really help you know your customer. And you because you have to be able to connect the dots between your customers and your bigger audience <clears throat> because it's your audience that you will put into that very top of the funnel that Andrea talked about at the beginning of our webinar that come down and trickle into the customers that you convert to your brand. This is why it's so important because that's how you understand the jobs to be done. Now there was a Harvard Business Review article that was written by Clayton Christensen and he said, if you wanna really know your customers, know what jobs do they have to get done. So. In Zipcar's case, they knew that people wanted to have transportation, but they didn't want the expense, obligation, and, and environmental impact of owning a car. So that was the job that they had to get done. This is why it's so very important. Now, for the last thing, we're going to look at platform. So when we look at somebody who's phenomenally successful with branding, I don't think you could ever have that conversation without looking at Oprah. And one of the reasons that she is such a household name is because she started with a platform that tied all that we've talked about so far together. So she started with her purpose. She's talked about, she knew from the time she was a really young girl that she wanted to be a teacher. And she's known for um, inspiring her students to be way bigger than they ever thought that they could be. And then the next thing she knew was her personality. When we go back to the brand archetypes, Oprah's really a blend. She's a sage, wisdom and key, and she's always seeking truth. She's a caregiver who wants to nurture you, and she's the every man or, or every woman who's so far removed from pretentiousness that she can appeal to people, and she knows the audience that she's going after. So when we look at her audience, for her talk show, more than 70% were women, and over 65% were 35 years or older. They were educated, they were tech savvy, they were politically astute. 
And that's why her talk show was one of the most successful on TV history in that category. And she was able to look at how does she move that to her production studio and her magazine. And that's how she was able to move into other platforms like movies. So she's brought a tremendous amount of star power and box office sales to last year's hit movie, um, A Wrinkle in Time. And she's done it with other movies like The Color Purple and animated shows like Charlotte's Web. Now, she was able to direct people to her other projects because her primary platform, her daytime talk show, was so highly rated. And then before she ended that show, she launched her O, oh, the Oprah magazine. Now, almost 20 years after she launched the magazine, because the, the show's gone off the air, it's still tremendously successful. So they have 2.4 million monthly subscribers to the print magazine, and it's one of the top women's publication in the US. Now, this emphasis on brands owning platforms is the reason we've heard so much about content marketing in the last 10 years. So it's like Oprah understood, being able to own the distribution channel of your content, whether that's a print magazine like Oprah, Oprah, or even this webinar that we're on right now, it's one of the most successful ways to make an impact with your brand and spotlight your uniqueness. But there's companies who still don't get this right. And here's a brand that was doing so well that I am sad to see is starting to fail because it's Intel and their IQ site. So they started out using IQ by Intel as their own media property. But as you can, you can see, these are articles right from their homepage. They haven't been updated for since August of 2016. So in a tech industry, they haven't published anything for that long. And that's an incredibly harmful thing, especially for a tech company to do is to show that you're lagging behind. And so it's, um, it's not a commitment to a platform. And it's, it's something that companies tend to do. They'll say, we're gonna start a platform, a magazine or you know, a blog, and then, then they abandon it because they don't have a commitment to an audience, and then they quit showing up. So when we look at brands that do this really, really well, this is one of my absolute favorite examples of creating a really unique platform to amplify the uniqueness of a brand. This is Trish Watowski, and if you work directly in the printing industry, you may know her because she is her own true celebrity in the print industry. Because she owns, um, she owns a couple of companies, but this is one called Fold Factory, and that teaches people in the print industry about all of these unusual ways that they can fold a printed piece. So when it comes to a brand archetype, Trish is definitely a sage. She wrote a two volume definitive guide on how to fold things. And it gives you everything you would ever need to know, dimensions, cut lines, everything. But she found out that she needed a platform to help build her audience and share this message that she had for people in the print industry. So this was around the time that YouTube was starting up and she thought, what the heck, maybe I'll make some videos to show people what they can do with folds that are super creative that they didn't know how to do. So with her 60 second fold of the week, she has become a YouTube celebrity for a couple of reasons. So first is because she knew her purpose was to educate people and get them excited about all of these amazing opportunities with print that they didn't know. Second was her personality. I mean, she's kind of introverted, but as you can see on her shirt here, it says LMFO for laugh my fold up. Now every week she has a new saying on her t-shirt, like, is there a fold in my soup? And she's done this, these videos every single week for five years. So she has a lot of t-shirt sayings, but she keeps coming up with these new ones and she has every single shirt that she's ever worn on her show. People love this because it adds humor, it adds relatability to Trish. Then the next thing that she does is that she is consistently showing up and so you can see here in the bottom left, this one video has 27,362 views. So some have as many as 50 or 60,000 views, but most are in the range of two to 5,000. Now, when you compare it to 27,000 or 60,000, 5,000 might not sound like a much compared to somebody even like Oprah and her platform, but think about what it would mean to the impact of your brand and how you'd be able to amplify it if you consistently every single week for five years got in front of two to 5,000 people who were your target audience. 
how might that start making people pick up the phone and call you instead of the other way around? What if you had more requests for salespeople to reach out to qualified leads than you knew what to do with? And you look at Trisha's subscriber base. She has almost 7,000 subscribers. This is the power of a platform. Now, when we look at our universal truths for platforms, here's what I want you to remember. Focus on one main platform where people can find you, whether that's an event, a video, a print magazine, and then stick with it. Give it time to play out and really have a commitment to it. The second thing, when you consistently show up, people will notice. So be willing to stick with it for the long term because this is what builds trust. Now, we've covered a lot in this, in this uh, last 48, 50 minutes here, but here's what I want you to remember from this. This is what I want you to take away. First, I want you to define and articulate your brand purpose and values, just like Richard Branson does for Virgin. The second thing is that I want you to understand the personality that you wanna to convey to the world through your brand. Go through and take that brand archetype test. Read about the different archetypes and see how you've been showing up and how you want to show up. The third thing is identify the people that matter to you most. Who's your target audience? And the last thing is to identify and um, develop an identifiable platform from which you can consistently share your message. And you look at the success that Oprah has had, and I call her mini Oprah with Trish Witowski. This is what I want you to remember, because these four things are the beginning of creating a chemical attraction for your brand. And I wanna underscore that part, because that's gonna be the webinar that we're going to have next on May 22nd, is talking about how now you have this chemical attraction, how do you turn these lukewarm leads into really, really loyal customers? How do you convert them? So with that, it's been a fabulous time. I don't know if we have any questions. Andrea, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Carla. The examples that you've shared today about how other brands and influencers are making an impact were absolutely great. And I hope that everyone on the webinar was able to relate to one of the universal truths discussed during the session and really think about ways to tap into those truths for your own company. Now, Carla has done a great job providing some best practices to build your brand's uniqueness and influence. And I just wanna remind everybody to keep in mind that building a strong, memorable brand doesn't need to be a tough job. Now, when it comes to developing an impactful brand, you don't have to go at it alone. Allegra can be your strategic partner as you work to identify your brand's unique personality. We're a local single source that can be there throughout the planning process, taking your brand beyond just the logo and tagline to clearly articulate your purpose and values to help you make mean, meaningful connections with your audience as they move through the customer journey. And as you're building your brand on and offline, we're here to help execute on those tactics to help you show up consistently and gain more exposure in your market. So it does look like we have a few questions that have come in for Carla, so we're gonna take a few minutes to answer them. Um, first question, Carla, how do you brand yourself if you service as an intermediary organization? You know, I, I, again, it's looking at what's the value that you deliver. How are you connecting the two groups that you serve as the intermediary, intermediary for? And what's the value that you're delivering to both of them? So, you know, I'm a big post-it note person, whiteboard person. I think that's why I went into, <laughs> into marketing because I love the numbers and I love all the colorful things that go with it. So to start with this, liter this is literally what I have my clients do is to take a stack of sticky notes and start writing all the things that you do, one per sticky note, and write them on a sticky note, put them up on a wall. Write it down, put it up on the wall. And what you'll start to see is that if you do that for um, uh, the group you're uh, connecting to first, and you'll have all this list of words, then the, word, the group you're connecting from with those list of words, what you'll start to see is an overlap of words. So that shows how you can start to be consistent. Now from there, I mean, it's hard to know because I don't know what industry or business or anything about it, but I say understanding that value that you deliver there, then look at how that um, connects to a purpose. What is that job that you're helping both of these groups of people to get done every single day? 
Thanks, Carla. And I, I think that that kind of helps lead into this next question here as well. Um, what if your brand caters to different age groups and people? You know, I think Zipcar is a great example of a brand that, that caters to different age groups and types of people. So again, I think the important thing with branding is to not get stuck on demographics. Demographics come way down the line, and I think they're used differently now than they have in the past. So what you're looking for, what are those common denominators that matter to this group of people, regardless of their age, regardless of their background? That's what you're looking for. You know, those little universal truths that apply to everybody in this group. And that's where I always go back to the sticky notes because I think writing these down and putting them up on a wall, that's where you start to see these commonalities. You know, what is it that is the consistent overlap with every one of these groups of people? Thank you, uh, that's, that's great, Carla, thanks so much. Um, the next question that we have is, how do you recommend that you brand your company when you do something that is so similar to other businesses like a web design agency? You know, I think, it, and I think that's something that people get com uh, caught up in, is that they feel that they're kind of in a commodity market to start with, but what is it about your company and why it was started that truly makes it unique. So when I do brand purpose workshops for clients, one of the very first things that I do is, you know, depending on the age of the company and what the leadership is like, is get the founder in there and what is it that they believe that they could do better than anyone else and that's why they started their company. So there's always an underlying reason that's beyond just the services that you provide or, or making money. Like what did that person see that was truly a hole in the market that only you could deliver on? And it's not unusual that as we get going as companies, it doesn't matter how big or small we are, we forget those original driving things. So that's, a, that's the very first place that I always suggest that people go to, to uncover some of those characteristics that make them stand out and be different from everybody else. Great, thank you. Um, and we do have um, one final question, um, and, and this is in regard to a rebrand. So if, if a company has their vision, mission, and purpose defined, what would you recommend as the first step towards a rebrand? And this is another one that's kind of hard to, to answer specifically because I don't know the background of the company and, and why they're going through the rebrand, which is always important. But next, you need to articulate those values. Like, are they the same? Or maybe this is the first time that you've articulated them for, you know, articulated them for a company. Is that what you're going to do is put together a plan and say, this is how we're going to show up. And now these are specific tangible expressions of this new brand in how we behave, how we talk, what we say about ourselves, and how we'll show up both internally to our employees and externally to customers and potential customers. Now with a rebrand, I the companies that are the most successful with a rebrand rebrand spend at least as much time internally getting employees to understand the why, what, how, all of those things behind it as they do externally because these are the people who are going to prove that what you did as a rebrand is an actual from the heart, it has meaning and you believe it thing other than back to just you know putting on a new coat of paint and tidying up the, the shutters. That's the place where you will truly demonstrate to your customer and prospective customers that this rebrand has meat behind it. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much, Carla. Those are all the questions that we have for today. So I just want to thank everyone for participating and thank you, Carla, as well. Um, as Carla mentioned, our next webinar is on May 22nd. And I do just want to remind everyone um, that by registering for today's webinar, you are signed up for the next webinar. Um, also, if you know anybody else that would benefit from this information, um, we encourage you to uh, share the AllegroWebinar.com link with them so they can re register for the remainder of the series. Um, that wraps up our session for today. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, you've learned about some ways that you can tap into your natural brand personality, uh, but if you need additional support amplifying your brand and building that brand influence, please contact your local expert at Allegra.
Um, if you aren't already working with us, you can find your nearest partner by visiting AllegraMarketingPrint.com. Thank you again, Carla, and we hope everyone has a wonderful day.